Welcome to unit three of this week. Um, this will be the first unit where we will, you will learn more about the enabler process. And um, the purpose of this unit is to understand really now the basic approach, how to design for innovation. Maybe if we take a look at when, when you think about what makes a solution or a service innovative. So um, you probably think about breakthrough technology which is involved. Maybe um, features which are made possible by a new technology. You might also think about uh, genius business models which make uh, a solution innovative. Um, and you're right, these are definitely um, important aspects of innovation. Um, nevertheless, to fulfill really our definition of innovation, the solution or the service must on top of this also delight the users. So if nobody um, likes the solution, if nobody um, desires the solution, if nobody wants to use the service, it's not really the, um, innovative. It hasn't fulfilled its goal. So um, this, this what we call desirability or also great user experience. This is an aspect you cannot add on later on a product or a service. This is something you need to really um, start from the start consider um, in the design and innovation process. And um, the core strategy to do this is to involve users from the start into the process. Um, and how to do this, uh, we would like to explain you in this unit. So um, the core principles um, of um, innovative work are, as said, the user centricity. So starting with really understanding the needs of the users and context. Also, um, you remember that maybe from the, the mindset of the innovators to um, build solutions early, to experiment, to create prototypes, to visualize your ideas and to test them. And um, also the principle to not, not being afraid of failing and learning instead of, instead of considering failures as uh, possibilities to learn and um, to iterate on your ideas. These are the core principles um, for um, innovative work. And we at SAP, we use these principles as well to establish our own innovation process. So we at SAP, we took um, these principles and um, established our own design thinking process, which you can see here. It starts with discover, which is about understanding the, the problems, understanding the user needs, um, and defining really the problem which, which has to be solved. Um, and uh, goes then into design, which is really about um, testing solutions, creating first prototypes, testing them, learning and um, deliver, which is then about um, uh, making the solution real, um, uh, making it productive, develop it, and uh, test it uh, um, then directly in the, um, in the usage, so to speak. <clears throat> and we will go now step by step through the different um, steps in these uh, phases. And um, we start with discover. Um, and we start with the, to with the topic scope. So um, the first thing um, uh, when you have uh, a defined uh, design challenge, innovation challenge, is to uh, be clear about the scope, to understand really the, the, what is behind this, this challenge, to um, collect what you already maybe know about it, what may, might be challenges, what might be obstacles you have to face, who are your stakeholders, um, who are your users also um, potentially, and to really um, together as an innovation team um, get a picture on um, what is actually the, the context of our, our challenge we, we want to tackle. And um, there are different methods to do this. Um, one way is uh, um, definitely to reframe the challenge, to really um, understand um, and collect uh, uh, who could be a, a user in that challenge, to uh, choose then a specific focus in the challenge and to uh, reframe the challenge in the way of um, uh, uh, it fits to, to you as a team where you think that is the focus uh, uh, for, for this project we want to tackle. And after you um, are clear in the first place with this challenge, you go to the next phase, which is called 360 degree research. Here it is really about um, uh, understanding the user's needs, understanding the context, and um, doing really broad research um, uh, to, to uh, find out um, uh, what challenges are there, what pain points are there, what could be important aspects to consider. And um, <clears throat> the, the core mindset um, you have to um, apply there is really to um, be curious, 
to ask and listen, to really uh, really talk to users and listen what they are saying, and um, to be um, uh, open-minded and watch and observe how they behave, to, to, to possibly identify flaws in the existing process, and um, also maybe to um, get into the shoes of the users and um, try out things, do things, and experience how they, um, how they uh, experience basically um, the, the current situation. And um, I have a, have a great example story actually, which, which highlights why empathy is so important for, for users. So um, what you can see here is, um, uh, maybe you know it, it's an MRI scanner, and it's, it's used in a, a medical context to take ana anatomical images of a scanned person. So um, doctors can see, simply said, with this machine inside a person without, without cutting, um, and they can also see different angles um, inside of a, of a human. And um, <clears throat> this machine, um, or involved in the design of this machine, was a guy called Doug Dietz, working for um, General Electric Healthcare. And um, uh, apparently he was very proud about this, this design, but um, at, at one day he, he saw a little girl in hospital, which was um, supposed to, to be scanned in this scanner. And she was uh, uh, crying, actually, because she was so afraid of um, being scanned in this scanner. And um, that was, ha was never been a Duck Deed's intention to, um, to uh, uh, design a machine that scares children. So um, he was really horrified by, by this experience. And um, <clears throat> he turned to, um, to the Stanford D School. Um, and uh, together with them, they, they redesigned um, the machine. Um, and um, core of this approach was really to um, talk um, to uh, really um, child experts, to, um, to doctors um, who can uh, tell them about how children experience this procedure. Also, they observed how um, children, um, uh, children really um, experience uh, the situation. And um, based on these insights, they were able to build up empathy for these children. And um, <clears throat> He said, um, uh, really, from from that from that uh, moment, kneeling down and looking from the perspective of the, the children, he really got uh, different perspectives and really got new insights and ideas how he could redesign the, the machine. And um, this is the result, <clears throat> actually, of this design project they did. So, um, based on the user research, they. Um, uh, redesigned the MI, MRI machines, having pleasant pictures painted on them, and they embedded them in a whole experience. So they created stories around the machine um, from, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you, are, you are lying down in a canoe and you, don't, uh, you, you are not allowed to move because fishes will start to jump on you. They um, thought about which music they want to, uh, would play in the room. They even used aromatic oils to um, enhance this experience and um, already started um, to help the children to jump into this story from, from the start of the, the um, examination. And um, it showed that the children really, really enjoyed this experience and um, showed much less fear. And um, the really interesting thing is that um, only 1% of the children in the first year when they, when they um, rolled out this um, had, it, had to uh, be sedated before this um, scanning. So before that, it was really 80% of the children which had to be sedated um, to go uh, to be scanned in this MRI scanner. And um, I think that is a very strong story which shows you how important it is to, um, to build up empathy and to understand how users experience solutions. <clears throat> And to do this, um, also in our context um, of driving innovation processes, it's important to, from the start, to talk to end users, to observe them in their context where they are working, and to um, understand their pain points, their needs, and their challenges. So the next step um, in the discover phase, so we are still in the, in the mode where we understand, um, where we have to understand the problem which has to be solved. So the next step is the, the um, uh, synthesis. <clears throat> so in synthesis, it's about, um, so imagine you have now, um, you have now run um, a lot of interviews with users. You have done maybe different forms of research. You have also data from market research. And you have basically a mass of information. And now the challenge is how to structure this and how to really um, get out the insights of this um, information, to make meaning out of it. 
And um, the goal of this synthesis step is to really define then a user-centered problem statement, so really to have a sharpened focus um, for, for design. And the underlying approach we are using here um, is called diverging and converging. So starting from a lot of information, a lot of unstructured information, um, to um, really um, then uh, deciding, um, structuring, and deciding which are really the interesting things we want to uh, focus on. Um, that is then the, the converging part and really defining this clear focus uh, for um, as a result of the synthesis phase. And, um, we use basically the same approach, the same mindset later on than in, um, in the design uh, uh, phase, um, where, where we start with many ideas. And then from this um, mass of ideas, we select then the most valuable ones to um, uh, develop them further. <clears throat> so there are many methods. Um, you can use, we have also in our innovation culture toolkit actually many, many templates which can help you um, in, in uh, uh, really um, doing the synthesis. Um, a very, um, let's say, um, proven approach is to start with storytelling, so um, transferring the insights um, you got from, from the research to the whole team, because you might not be able to do this research with all the team um, all the time. Um, then based on this information on a whiteboard maybe to cluster this information to um, to really get get some understanding uh, where where where's the meaning behind this this information you have collected um, a good way of um, of representing the user of making it more tangible is a persona which is a, a user profile which um, which um, describes an example user with all her needs and challenges and pain points and so on. And, and there are, as, as I said, there are many um, frameworks where you can bring in structure into this data and where you can really get the meaning out of this data. And the result, the focus um, is basically then, again, a version of a reframed design challenge, you can say, the so-called point of view or POV. It's a combination out of um, what is our user, what is the core need of the user, and what insight um, or what was the core insight we collected in our um, uh, our uh, user research activities. So this is then really the result and the problem statement for, for the design phase. So um, we have now talked a lot and examined a lot what it's, what it's about to understand the problem to be solved in an innovation project. But um, Edda, how, how do we deal now with this? How do we continue in the process? Yes, so let's start into design phase of, of the process. Um, and as Matthias said at the beginning, um, where we uh, diverge and converge a lot. So now we are starting to, to diverge again. So uh, the, the starting point of the design phase is the point of view that comes out of this uh, discover phase so that we really have a clear focus what the user needs. And out of this, we create uh, questions. So we create questions that are very um, that are user centered, that uh, include the need, and they are also very crisp so that they are good to, to ideate on, good to solve. And then we use different uh, brainstorming methods to find ideas for this, for this question. So um, it's important that, that also, um, even if you think you have no ideas anymore, you find a new method to get more ideas. So there's also, um, the quantity is important. And even if you think, yeah, we know already it's gonna be an app, uh, there are still many things to brainstorm about and, and things around the app and within the app to, to find solutions for that and to find different solutions for that. And in the end, um, it's important to prioritize and to select ideas, but for the beginning, uh, you need a lot of ideas. And maybe as an example question, just that you have an idea how this could look like, uh, when we, we did a production uh, workbench uh, a project and uh, one question for example was how might we help Willie which was the production worker to fulfill the necessary side tasks that he has to do that are independent from a production order in a simple correct way and on time so this could be for example a question for such a brainstorming when you do this ideation the most important thing is that you have the right mindset so uh, I think all of you know, you, you hear an idea and the first thing that comes into your mind is why does this idea not work? <laughs> and we tried it already and it's, 
it, it costs too much or whatever. There are always many arguments why ideas are not good, um, but this uh, is not a good basis for an ideation. So uh, the right mindset is important to be positive and uh, every idea is valid. So for this, and we talked about this in the people unit, for this, we really need also a coach. So the coach um, uh, creates the right atmosphere for the team, the right atmosphere for ideation. Um, it makes... He, he or she makes the saturates the space, makes an inspiring working environment, and also, for example, do some warm ups. Or, 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 or uh, in in this example with the production case, we even went uh, together with some team members. We went out and looked at some um, at at, a, at another company and how do they solve the problem to get inspired. So really, uh, try to get this inspiring working environment. And the coach also um, um, ensures that you follow some of the brainstorming rules, we call them. Um, these are rules that help you that you get to some ideas, because otherwise it's the most obvious idea that you usually always get to, but that's not what we want. So the, the most important thing we talked about it is defer the judgment and build on ideas of others and do not select ideas yet. And the second, maybe most important thing is really go for quantities and what for quantity. And what's also very difficult sometimes is, is go for wild ideas because people think, yeah, wild ideas. Well, why should I generate wild ideas? But in the end, there are very interesting and important aspects that you can take off, out of wild ideas. So um, even if you have already a solution in mind, don't neglect the ideation phase and uh, it's also the diversity of a team is very important for this and we talked about diversity in our in our people unit as well now after the ideation when you have selected some ideas uh, for example um, you could select ideas based on which are the most important for the user or which are maybe easy to implement, then you go into the prototyping phase. And in prototyping, the goal is really to make, idea, make your ideas tangible. But in the end, we have prototypes for different purposes. So you could prototype within the team to better understand ideas and develop it further. You, of course, prototype to go out to your users and make your ideas testable, experienceable. And you also prototype to show you and present your ideas to your stakeholders. So there are different ways uh, or different yeah, purposes uh, for which you create prototypes. And the most important thing about prototypes is they should not be perfect. So the prototype is not a perfect system. The, the less perfect the prototype is in the beginning, the better, because the more feedback and the better feedback you get. And here um, you see one possibility and a great way of prototyping. And uh, when, when we look at, at our projects and so on, we always start with the process at the beginning. Yeah. So um, what is the future to be process that you want to create for your customer or for, for, for your unit? And in order to, to, um, yeah, to create this uh, to be process also in a very creative and in a collaborative way, we have uh, created scenes. That's what you see here. It's a tool. Um, it's a tool that you can create to, um, uh, to to do a great storyboard. Because when you want to draw a storyboard, many people say, "Oh, I cannot draw, and it's so difficult." But um, here, you don't have to draw. You you just use uh, predefined elements um, in order to build your scenes and to build your your customer journey, your to be journey and to make uh, your ideas tangible. And we use this a lot in our project and it, it also works. Uh, the stakeholder presentations are, are really well received with this. And um, recently we, we used it mainly only um, virtually and it also works very well virtually. It's also available virtually. So um, scenes and mosaic, like we had in the previous unit, they are all part of this um, innovation culture toolkit for, for virtual collaboration. It exists as well that you can download um, from the web and that you can also, also use for yourself to get started. In the end, uh, when you have 
ideas and you have created a prototype, you need to validate and to test them. And again, get out to the users, uh, get feedback. And testing is really not to be confirmed that you're right, but to learn more about it. And that's, I think, the most important thing about it. And uh, that uh, uh, brings this user-centric, uh, brings it back to the user again. And uh, um, you can test certain aspects in the beginning, for example, when you have early prototypes, you don't prototype the whole thing, you prototype certain aspects. Um, but maybe with later prototypes, when you, for example, have a clickable mock-up or something like that, you are testing a certain scenarios with your users. So, for example, we went with our mock-up into the production hall and we tested them on-site at, this, at, at, the, at the place where the worker uh, really has to work with it. After that, <laughs> you iterate quite a lot, but at the end, um, yeah, we come to the deliver phase um, in, in the next unit, but before we go into this, we, we often get the question, yeah, when do we apply this? Um, what kind of um, challenges do we have? What kind of needs in order to apply this process or to apply this method? Um, from our point of view, it's, it's, it's more a mindset. We talked about it and it's always valid, but of course, um, when you plan with a team, you always uh, you also have different needs and different possibilities how to use it and when to use it. Yeah? So there are different routes depending on your new user needs and you iterate through different cycles. For example, you could, um, if you just um, want to uh, create awareness then, um, and, and you want to uh, have your stakeholders to buy in the method and create the mindset, you start with some awareness sessions. You would have workshops for the teams in order to get used to the, to the uh, methodology or in order to uh, kind of get, find a focus, to find your challenge and um, uh, a, a start, a sco a start a scoping of a project. And in the end, of course, um, you can have projects in several sizes uh, where you uh, apply that and you plan that. And the most important thing, I think, it's it's not about the format and, and it's, it's, it's so flexible. You can always adapt it and you can uh, use it basically in any way, but it's really about the mindset and the principles and always apply this in the end when you approach a challenge. Um, with customers, we often get also the, the, the question, yeah, uh, what are the prerequisites? And uh, maybe as a, as a, as a quick, uh, as a, as a quick uh, rule, you look at the solution space and you look at the problem space. And um, the more open it is and the, the more wide the solution space is and the more wide the problem space is, the better it is in order to apply this, uh, yeah, this, this approach. But of course, you can also vary it. So you can say, um, we, ex we have maybe a, a, a bigger solution space, but we, no, we have quite a well-known problem, then you start already with a prototype or you have already, um, you, you know where it's going, into which direction, but you don't know much about the needs of the users, then you start with an extended research. So you can put your focus on what, what, is, what is needed. But in the end, uh, always think about the princi principles and they are always valid if you call it uh, design thinking or human-centered innovation approach or whatever or not. Um, always think about uh, these principles we, we talked about earlier. This was um, the process overall and um, now reflect a bit what what we what we talked about and how it looks in your environment. So check out the process section of this innovation culture toolkit that we talked about and get an overview of the templates and the best practices for each phase. So you can go in there and uh, you also see the phases we, that we talked about. And we have some templates there that are very helpful that you can use for yourself and that you can apply directly uh, in, in your projects. And, um, we also put this into a virtual environment, so you can also check it out, um, how you use this in a virtual setup uh, in your workshops. 
the key takeaways for this unit. Let, for this unit, now let's come to this. So um, I, we, we uh, like Matthias explained in the beginning, always start with the problem. We did the scoping, then follow the user-centered approach. Constantly iterate, fail, and learn on the way. Um, choose the right format or adjust it if you kind of see that uh, you have different needs and apply it to the right challenges. And this was now basically um, how we approach the problem and, and how we design a solution. And in the, in the next unit, we talk about more how we really make it real in the organization, how we implement it, how we scale it, and how we run it. See you in the next unit.